All right. Hi, everyone. We are live. Welcome to Market Matters. My name is Katie Kuntz, and I'm a social media editor here at CNBC. I'm joined, as always, by our senior markets correspondent, Bob Pisani. And today we're going to be answering all of your questions about the latest stock market moves. How are you doing, Bob? Hey, Katie. Hey. How are, how are you doing, Bob? Good. I'm getting a little echo here. You know. Oh, a little delay. Um, yeah. All right. Do you can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. All, all good. Um, so uh, been a while since we've had a chance to chat. A couple of weeks. Yeah. Oh, so good. Jump right into things. Um, so first up, Bob, just how are stocks performing so far this year? I'm getting a little bounce back, uh, Katie, from in the studio here. All right. Um, let's uh, start over in one second. We'll try this again. All right, so let's try this again. How are you doing, Bob? <laughs> we we uh, got some reverb there, but uh, I think we're good. All good uh, now? All right. Yeah. Well, let's just jump right into it. We have a lot to talk to um, you about today, Bob. Um, but first up, can you just tell us how are stocks doing so far this year? Well, look where we're at today. I don't know if you're following the market, but we just hit 4,800. If we close here, this is an historic high. The old historic high was two years ago, almost exactly. It was 2022. January 3rd, 2022, uh, and we're here. Uh, this is a little unlikely because it's being led by tech stocks. And everyone thought, well, gosh, we had such a great year last year. I mean, NVIDIA was up 200%. It can happen again. It's unlikely to have such outperformance again. It, you don't normally get that. You get what's called reversion to the mean. Stuff that did terrible tends to do a little better. Stuff that did really great tends to underperform. Well, guess what? Wrong. So <laughs> the the... We started off the year, tech stocks were down, S&P was down uh, January 4th or so. I think we were down almost 2%. And everybody kept saying, oh, well, this is it. We're going to get some kind of garden variety correction down 5% or 10% because we had such a big year last year, up 24%. But didn't happen. <laughs> we were down, I think, 1.7% at the worst. I think it was January 4th. And um, from there, we just started rallying again. And the only thing I have to complain about is actually it is tech. So everybody was wrong. This assumption, oh, can't be led by tech. So far, wrong. So we got new highs in NVIDIA, uh, new highs uh, in uh, Alphabet, new highs in Microsoft, you know, all the usual suspects. Apple's not, but it's only down 1% or so um, for the year. So uh, what I have to complain about is the rest of the market's not cooperating. Uh, energy's having a terrible time. Banks are up today, but they're down almost three, four percent for the month. Um, real estate, consumer staples aren't doing anything. The only thing that's doing something besides tech is healthcare, which did not have a good year last year overall. Uh, and it's starting to move up. So if you look, the way to look at this is look at the equal weight S&P, the RSP, it's called. That is down two percent 
this month, the S&P, which is market cap weighted, is up 1%. So the average stock is down this year. And that's a problem uh, for everybody right now. Um, the, the, now we're back to this complaint about, can we get the market to broaden out? So this is why you own index funds, folks. The S&P 500, up 1% on the year. You don't have to figure out and pick a lot of stocks. You just kind of go with the momentum. And right now, the momentum still is with big cap uh, technology. So, Bob, it's 2024. We have an election. Um, how do you think the presidential election will impact markets this year? Well, there's a very well-studied phenomenon. The presidential election year, when there is a sitting president, tends to outperform. And the standard theory about this is the president has certain levers that they can pull to help stimulate the economy in certain ways to help things out. That's the sort of standard explanation. I'm not terribly big on all these seasonal things. I report on them, but a lot of times they don't work. Um, so we'll see what goes on. I, I think it's going to be a, a year with a lot of you know, volatility potentially, uh, just because we have so much stuff. We've got stocks at new highs. So remember, when you get in a new high, you there's pressure on the the the, the pain trade is would be normally down at that point because it's hard to keep pushing stuff forward. You've got to have a lot of companies that are reporting decent earnings, or you've got to have the biggest companies with good earnings. Now, what happened last year was the biggest companies ran up tech companies on the AI craze. That may well work again this year. This may be that once, you know, in a generation thing where, you know, you do get significant outperformance for several years in a row because, uh, AI is such a game changer, just like the internet was a game changer in the 1990s. I don't know. But again, <laughs> this is why people stay in indexes, because it's very hard to figure this out. Good luck trying to guess it. So traditionally, this should be an up year uh, because you have a sitting president. But I wouldn't go uh, making large investments on, on that old hoary chestnut. So, Bob, you've worked at the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for a long time, many years. Um, what do you think the floor of the New York Stock Exchange will look like in 20 years from now? Oh, gosh. Well, I'm almost 70, so that's a long way. I don't know if I'm going to make it that far. Um, I'm trying to remember when I first came on the floor. I started doing my first reports on the floor, probably 93 or 4, Um I came full time on the floor in the summer of 97. So what was that? 27 years ago. When I got there, there were about 4,000 people on the floor. Uh, and today there's probably less than 300. Uh, and what, it, what has happened in those years is two things. Uh, first is there was a major change in uh, the spread. When I got there in 90, 96, they were still trading in eights. So the, the, the bid ask was 12 and a half cents wide, an eighth of a dollar. So you, 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 you bid 100 and the ask was 100 and an eighth. You can make a lot of money on a 12 and a half cent spread if you're a broker. Think about that. And in 1997, it went to 16, six and a quarter cents. So the bid 100, ask is 100.06. And then in 2000, it went to a penny. So the profitability on the spread collapsed from 12 and a half cents in 96 to one penny in 2000. That helped ruin a lot of sell side businesses. The other thing that happened was technology, electronic trading. So when I got there at the NYSE, very and, and NASDAQ was already going uh, electronic, but large parts of the NYSE was still basically floor operations. We had what we called open outcry. We had a, 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 a broker dealer and a, a, a a, a, a person who was a market maker, uh, we call them specialists at the time. Today, they're called designated market makers. And the market maker had a, had a GE guy on, there on the floor. He had an obligation to make a market in GE, and people came up to him to buy and sell GE stock. A lot of that went away because uh, the broker itself became somewhat, not irrelevant, but there were ways very quickly, the technology moved very quickly. So you suddenly had hardware and software working together where you could create matching engines, where all of a sudden it was possible to have, say, Merrill Lynch's order to buy 10,000 Pfizer, rather than going onto the floor, getting their floor broker to go over to the specialist in Pfizer, that Merrill Lynch was able to hook directly in. 
uh, to the to the floor community uh, and electronically post it. And this, again, the software got really good in the 1990s where you could electronically match buy and sell orders together at, uh, at the right price, at, at the current price. And that sort of changed everything. Go into pennies and the electronic trading sort of collapsed the business. And the entire industry changed in front of my eyes. When I got there in 96, again, 4,000 people did 80% of the volume on the floor. And today you have 300, or less than 300, doing 15 to 20% of the volume there on the floor. You see, that's, that's technological disruption at its finest right there. So when you come on the floor, you look at, the, look at me when I'm on the floor reporting, you won't see a lot of people necessarily. And that's because the brokers, the floor brokers that used to be there aren't there in the same numbers at a fraction of what they used to be because it's not, they don't have to stand in front of somebody, a specialist uh, talking to him saying, I got a hundred thousand shares of Pfizer. I need to buy what, give me a, give me a, give me a bid here. Uh, so because of that, it looks kind of quiet on the floor. The market makers though are still very active. They're all still making a big, uh, market uh, in all of these stocks, and there's still a lot of information uh, there. So uh, your question is what it'll look like in 20 years. It's going to be even more electronic. Um, I think the issue uh, on about the floor is uh, do designated market makers, a centralized designated market maker still makes sense? And I, I think it does. Uh, and again, there's the main difference between the NYSE and the NASDAQ. And NASDAQ has many uh, different market makers. Uh, so it, it, we already have seen the big changes. All of those yelling brokers that you remember from the 1990s and into the 2000s, uh, for, for the most part, are gone. For IPOs, you'll still see them. They'll show up when it's nice to see it and it's fun. Uh, but listen, I have always been in favor of technological change because it makes things generally more efficient. And so I am nostalgic a bit and... Um, proud that I was there at the very height for the old brokerage system for the NYSC. And it was wonderful to see, believe me, 4,000 people crammed together is a real, it's a fraternity really is what it was. Uh, and I was proud to be a part of that, but I, I can't say I, I, I'm a little nostalgic, but I'm not wistful about it. I'm glad that the new system, it's more efficient, more stock volumes went up. And so this is what you have to be when you're, you know, a, technolo a technology enthusiast, you just have to keep looking forward. Change is gen generally, most change is good. And certainly the markets are, I think, run more efficiently than they were in the past. Well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see how things pan out. Um, but our next question, Bob, um, is about someone who, you kn who you've known for a long time, Art Cashin. Um, how did you meet Art? And what wisdom has he given you over the years? Well, I met Mart, I don't even remember. I probably met him in 94. I certainly met him in 96, 97. Uh, and by then he had already been on Wall Street almost 40 years. Uh, he, you know, he started in, oh gosh, 1959 or so. Um, and he got a seat at the New York Stock Exchange in 1964. So think about that. Uh, this is uh, 70 years ago. Um, and, uh, 60 years ago, uh, he was with Heretic, as I recall. Uh, and then he started with uh, Payne Weber in 1980 or so. So he had been with Payne Weber probably 15, 16 years by the time uh, I met him. And then uh, Payne Weber was bought by UBS, as I recall, and I'm, I don't remember the date. Uh, so, you know, the bottom line is it's been 27 years or something or 28 years. I don't remember like that. Um, but I, what what there's a whole chapter in the book about art in my book uh, shut up and keep talking about art and the important thing is art was a great market historian one of the greatest ones i've ever met and taught me a lot about market history but he wasn't an academic most market historians are academics but he wasn't and he used storytelling as a way to illustrate points and there's several of them in the book. I would encourage you to look at it. And what's wonderful about it is you can use storytelling as a way of teaching. And he helped me refine that. As a journalist, I was 
pretty good at telling stories already and crafting, you know, narratives. And a story is a narrative. And but he really was good at it. So I spent <laughs> I spent a lot of time with Art. Um, Art used to spend time upstairs at the New York Stock Exchange. There was a thing called the Luncheon Club, and there was a bar at the Luncheon Club. This is where Art held court for decades. And in 2006, the NYSE went public. As I mentioned, business had been essentially changing dramatically. The floor brokerage business collapsed. And, and NASDAQ and NYSE went public about the same time, around 2006. And one of the first things that was done as a cost-cutting move was to close the luncheon club. And it was a disaster for morale there because a lot of the old timers, their hearts were broken because that was the social hub. It was a big thing to bring a client to the NYC and go upstairs to the sixth floor, have breakfast, have lunch, and at four o'clock, market closes and the bar opens. So it closed in 2006 and it was, they said it was devastating for morale. And Art Cashin and a bunch of them picked up their glasses, literally picked up their glasses, went across the street to Bobby Vance or to Harry's uh, bar, Hanover Square, where which is still there. Um, so uh, I spent an awful, after that, I spent an awful lot of time uh, across the street uh, with Art. Uh, and he was, um, Art is quite a, uh, a, a poet, uh, in a sense, um, about the markets and about life in general. So you spend a lot of time with a guy and you get very fond of it after a while. And there emerged around that a very small group of people. We, he called them the FOFs, the Friends of Fermentation. And we would just sit around and chat about the markets and get together and have Christmas parties and things like that for years and years and years. Art is still around. Uh, I had uh, I met with him at Harry's uh, in the beginning of December. We, we did our annual uh, interview. Harry even came up. Harry himself, uh, the, the owner, came up from West Palm Beach. He's got a new restaurant there. And we had a wonderful time just chatting about old times. So he's given me a, 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 a wonderful friendship over the last 26 or 27 years. Yeah, you've certainly met a lot of really interesting people, um, Bob, over the years. Um, so our next question, um, our last question is about Bitcoin ETFs, which we finally uh, got recently. So what's your opinion on the new Bitcoin ETFs? Well, first of all, I'm glad it finally happened after 10 years. Um, I am a supporter of the Bitcoin ETF concept. I am a big bull on blockchain, big on uh, decentralized finance, big bull on smart contracts. I am not terribly enthusiastic about Bitcoin. And I have said this for years and years, and I haven't changed my opinion. Nothing I have seen has changed my opinion about this. First, wh why am I supporting Bitcoin ETFs, but not a big supporter of Bitcoin? Because people want to own this cryptocurrency, this Bitcoin. And it's not been safe for them to own it. Uh, what happens in an ETF environment is the custodian has a, a responsibility to store the Bitcoin for you. This is what happens with ETFs. You have a custodian. This is what happened with gold. In 2004, the gold ETF started. Prior to that, you know, there was a lot of old men sitting in the basement with gold coins and gold bars. Now, you can still do that if you want, but nobody needs to do that. People would put them in safes and forget the combination of the safe for the bars, or, you know, they'd lose track of them. They didn't know where they were anymore. This happened with Bitcoin. People couldn't figure out what their combinations were or their passwords were, or, and this is a real problem, they got stolen. Here, you have a safer environment. There is a custodian that owns it, and it mostly it's Coinbase for you, and they're responsible. If they lose it, they're on the hook for that. And you pay a fee, by the way, for doing that. So if for those who want to own this asset, this is a safer way to do it. It's that simple. With that said, I still don't see a use case for Bitcoin. This nonsense that it's digital gold is a marketing term. It has no meaning at all. It, it doesn't, it's not gold at all. Uh, and so when people want to add a new asset class, and that's what this is, it's an asset class. So stocks are an asset class. Uh, Bonds are an asset class. Real estate's an asset class. Commodities is an asset class. Arguably, even cash is an asset class. I'm, I'm not sure you can make it that way, but you know what I mean. So when you want to have a new asset class and say, okay, I want to put Bitcoin in my portfolio, what does it do for you? 
Well, it should do a couple, one of two things, or at least preferably both. Number one, it should lower the volatility of your portfolio, right? You don't want more, but that's not true. Bitcoin is crazy volatile. That doesn't help. Two, is it a diversifier? Eh, maybe, but it doesn't correlate with, with anything very well to a certain to extent. The only thing anybody's ever noticed is it correlates with is speculative technology. There's very loose correlation between Bitcoin and like Happy Woods Arc Fund. It's not perfect, but that's about the only thing. Uh, I, I just don't see it. As far as like this digital gold thing, it's baloney. Gold has a very long history as money. And what is money? Money is a medium of exchange. You get something for it, and a store of value. Th does Bitcoin a, a medium of exchange? No. Is it a store of value? I, I don't think so. I mean, you look at how it moves. How is that a store of value in that way? I don't think so. Also, gold has uses. Gold is used in jewelry. Gold is a real store of wealth for households, millions of households around the world, particularly in India and particularly in China. Household wealth is measured in parts of India by gold. You get gold when you get married. You get it part of a dowry. That's value. Gold has uses in industry, too. There is no comparison between gold and Bitcoin. Digital gold is just a marketing phrase. So I would be very careful about this. And the, the what people think is the fundamental value here. Here's a use case. Somebody who's in a foreign country where the, the currency is useless and they're in danger of having their assets confiscated. That's a use case. Yeah, I see that. That makes some sense to me. But everything else is kind of nonsense here. Uh, and this intellectual argument that somehow there was this person, Satoshi Nakamoto or whoever, uh, who invented this under the grounds that uh, fiat currencies are causing inflation and we can't trust them. Seriously, you want me to displace the full faith and credit of the United States government with Bitcoin? Really? You, you think that it's a good idea to have a currency controlled by something like this? I don't think so. And I don't think any government in the world is going to allow that to happen. And I wouldn't think you should allow that to happen. So go ahead and do what you want. Just don't go screaming around that it's, you know, digital gold. What you're seeing here is a get rich quick scheme. That's what's going on. Remember, this is just a cryptocurrency running off of the blockchain. Blockchain is real technology. Blockchain is very exciting technology. That's what you should be concentrating on. There's all sorts of wonderful things, smart contracts that can run off of the blockchain that really can make financial transactions less less friction and that excites me greatly creating some artificial currency that is a get rich quick scheme let's admit it doesn't excite me that much so i'm sorry i've been very consistent about this for a number of years and nothing i saw with this bitcoin etf uh as, as again supporter of, of the etf concept nothing i've seen recently is change my mind about it. All right. Well, that's all of our questions for today, Bob. Thank you, as always, for all of your responses. And thank you to everyone for sending questions in. Each thank week. you, guys. It was a great questions. Love the Bitcoin one. Always get to, always like talking about that. Yeah, Appreciate great to hear your perspective, Bob. Um, all right. All right and we'll talk again in a few weeks. Thank you. Take care, guys.